Hello and welcome back to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff and maker culture. I'm your host, Aaron, and joining me are... Uh, Christian. And Joe. And Brian. So this is going to be a very interesting show. It's our first, what, normal type of show in a while. Yeah. That's yeah. not an interview. Also, we are all varying levels of remote. Uh, we normally record remote, but we've got Joe and Chris and on the East Coast. I am at my parents' house this weekend because my furnace went out. And we all have varying levels of internet connectivity. So this can go any of which ways tonight. It's going to be an adventure. And this week, do we even have a topic to talk about? We don't. So we're just going to see where it goes. <laughs> Absolutely. Everything from here on out, after the news, will just be complete, just natural, <laughs> all natural. So let's get us started. Uh, so what are you guys drinking tonight, Chris? Oh, so I actually have a little bit of a story behind mine. Um, I am not going to actually disclose where I am on the East Coast. Because as running into my hotel room to get set up... I was talking to the uh, desk guy or the front desk um, and like explaining like, hey, this is what I do and like all that kind of stuff because he was asking. It's like, why are you trying to run and like, why do you have a mic stand with you? And I explained what the podcast is. And I was like, actually, do you guys have any beer around here? And he goes, you know, I was actually going to like drink this once it hit about 2 a.m. So if you want some beer, like, here you go. <laughs> <laughs> so nice. Brought to you by the front desk of a undisclosed location is Old Brawny. <laughs> <laughs> it's not half bad. <laughs> Excellent. What kind of beer is it? It is a hard cider. Oh. You even found a hard cider in a random front desk? <laughs> it just happened, man. It was freaking great. <laughs> I bet you're getting roofied right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at this point, I'll take my chances. <laughs> <laughs> Might be welcome. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm drinking a uh, Session Sour from Dogfish Head. It's the Sea Quench Ale. It apparently has black limes. What's a black lime? I don't know. Like as an ingredient or yes. just in general? It says blissfully brewed with lime juice and lime peel and black limes and sea salt. Oh, black limes. Black limes. Not, I heard black, black limes. <laughs> that would be weird. Uh, yeah, I'm like, as an ingredient? Apparently it <laughs> is like in dried general. normal limes. So when you dry a lime and then you mortar it, you get black limes. All right. Like the, like the explosive mortar? <laughs> yes. You shoot when it, you shoot it out, out of the cannon, then you get black <laughs> limes. The, the so charring, it's, really just all yeah. the gun, it's really all the gunpowder that makes it black, right? <laughs> yeah. From being shot. Okay. Uh. <laughs> what about you, Brian? I am drinking the same delightful beer that Joe is drinking. Cheers. Excellent, excellent. Neat. I am drinking a mixture of Kirkland vodka and Coke Zero. Because Does this guy know how to party or what? Are you you're <laughs> right back to the Kirkland vodka again? Yeah. <sighs> well, it's it's mostly just because it's the only thing I grabbed on my way to my parents' house. Because um, right. my furnace went out on Friday. And it's like the one thing that I can hide in drinks. I can just drink anything and just hide the vodka in it. And my parents aren't the biggest drinkers. They're like, they don't drink at all. So it's ah. kind of like, I need to be able to hide it. <laughs> nice. So so you were totally already, pulling like yeah. the high school equivalent of like carrying around the red solo cup and going, yes, no, it's totally oh, yeah. Pepsi oh, yeah. officer. <laughs> <laughs> no, this whole, this whole, this whole weekend feels like I'm just back living with my parents. Cause it's like, I'm hiding, vibe. I'm hiding alcohol around. And <laughs> I shut the, I shut the doors to the living room so I can curse during the podcast. So they can't hear me. And see, yeah. you need to be not wearing headphones. So the whole like beginning of the conversation could have just started as well. And just totally blown your cover. 
like my yeah. wife and I fooling around in the basement. It's all coming. It's, it's all coming Uh-oh. back. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! I all hope right. your parents listen to our podcast. All right, that's <laughs> no, okay. They don't support anything I do. Good, good. All right, we got that out of the way. <laughs> At least What's you next? have a dad. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> we start in there, baby. We go right into it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Normally, my thing's like, well, at least your dad talks to you. But at least, I guess, at least I have a dad. <laughs> What's that like? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh shit! This is gonna be interesting, baby. It's gonna be a fun one, boys. <laughs> Strap yourself in. We're either gonna I gain pr- a ton of followers or lose all of our subscribers. Nope, this you episode. are. <laughs> you are. Screwed. I promised myself I wouldn't clip this tonight, and I already clipped. Oh man, <laughs> it's okay. Okay. All so right. the next segment we usually do is the news, and I have a couple lined up. I don't know if any of you dingus has actually went through them no sure totally right. didn't well <laughs> um there's a guy named named daniel tartaglia he made a really awesome uh cheap and easily sourceable uh parts tumbler out of an old pc fan oh, where he cool. drilled a hole in one of the fins and put a little bolt <laughs> in one of the fins then attached it to like a plastic tupperware container that had a locking lid and then suspended it on some springs with some rubber bushings. And so then that way, the um, out-of-bounds fan would um, vibrate the Tupperware enough. That if you filled it with, like, I don't know what you fill it with, the walnut pieces. The tumbling media? Yeah. Um, the, because it's vibrating in a circle, it would kind of rotate the, the medium. Hmm. And it would, just, it would just clean your parts. And it's like a super simple build. And like most of us would have the parts lying around to make it. It was just a really awesome um, thing, and Hackaday did a, did a whole article on it. So, ah, oh, nice. That's the first article. I'm glad we had this great discussion over it. <laughs> yeah. So the second one is Apl- Applied Science Channel on YouTube did an awesome video on some electroluminescence paint, and I know, I I know watch Joe that. watched that. Yeah, and that's um, super cool. It's very cool and it's very expensive. I think he says like four hundred bucks for that kit, oh, wow. which is like a multi a multi layer approach where you 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 spray paint like a primer on your material, then you spray paint the actual uh, electroluminescent paint version, and then you do some sort of coating like a protect, protective coating on top. But the idea is it works just like your EL wire, where you just apply current to it and it will glow. Uh, um, but it's in a paint form, so any flat surface you could paint can yeah. glow. And it's amazing what because he did a lot of exper- uh, experiments on it and figuring out which materials work. And he even had a flexible piece of uh, plastic or something, or like a film that he did it on. And so he was actually bending it and then lining it up. Yeah. So he was actually making cool. little bendy displays. Oh, that's cool. So I think he designed an actual controller to power multiple lines so he actually did like a whole like you know 20 by 20 or 30 by 30 grid yeah of paint lines then he essentially made his own segmented display with it but then that requires some beefy a beefy controller to be able to process all of that which hasn't existed yet so he actually made this awesome controller that did all that and he open sourced it Wow. But like, um, okay. so it's like a twenty-ish long, twenty-minute long video on YouTube. But it's amazing, like the stuff that he's been looking at. So no, that like, it, like especially for some of the stuff I've done, and like one of my cosplays that I did was Kevin Flynn, and uh, how much like El Wire was like factored into that one is that kind of stuff like really piques my interest. So I'm gonna have to like spend a little bit more time looking at that because that could have some really cool project ideas to kind of tie into that stuff. That's really cool. Yeah, though. just because it's paint, like the, the sky's the limit yeah. with the application. No, absolutely. For the third one, it's not as interesting, but Hackaday had a really nice article 
on um, if you're selling something that you've made. It, it, it's titled, Your Bomb is Not Your Cogs. Both are acronyms, which is your bill of materials is not your cost of goods sold. A lot of makers tend to fall into a pitfall where they have this neat project and someone's like, oh, that's really neat. You know, are you going to sell these? I'd like to buy some. And like, oh, yeah, well, the parts are only like 20 bucks. So, I'll, you know, I can probably charge, you know, 30 bucks for it. But that doesn't, that's not going to include the labor of assembling it. Might not include the, the cost of the hot glue to glue th to put things together or, you know, wood glue or, you know, time to cut in the laser. So you're not maybe not taking into account like, you know, machine usage. It really, it, it, it's a really decent breakdown and they go into like, cycle time minutes assembling yeah. a pcb or doing all that stuff and breaking it down and then how much does that cost you in time and if it's not you what's it how's it how much does it cost you to pay somebody else to do it doing it in a way that is scalable if you were to actually start producing these things or mass producing these things mm -hmm. they huh. could do it in a way that's actually profitable conversations we've had Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people don't think of what actually goes into determining your cost of goods sold um, because you don't factor in like, you know, if, if your runtime on a machine is an hour, like how much electricity is that consuming? And, you know, once you start adding that up of, you know, hours and hours that that stuff really tax on. Um, and I think it's also good. A lot of people don't when they Not start out with smaller projects, they don't like um, they don't factor in like what the, they're actually worth and what their knowledge is worth and what their skill level is worth. So they price themselves hmm. low because they want people to like things. But then you end up undervaluing undervaluing yourself and undervaluing your product. Um, and it's really hard to to change that and come up from that. So um, it's always good to to price things as they need to be um, to make it worthwhile for, for longevity of your product. So that's an interesting point. How do you how do you price the skill of of the the person making it? Uh, <laughs> so a little bit of background of what I do is um I've been in the body of our industry for the last 16 years and so I I deal with buying things from wholesalers and then selling them at retail um in my retail store I, I we have a pretty standard markup that we follow but that lets us you know make sure that we're making some profit we can pay our employees we can restock that product um and then also pay the bills for buying that product and then I also have a wholesale company making body jewelry um, where I make everything from scratch. And then, you know, I, I have a wholesale division for that. And then I retail it in my stores as well. But when I'm talking on a wholesale level, I'm looking at the, the cost of my material, what I want to get paid per hour while I'm making it. And then any other factors that come into there, like the cost of my website, cost of advertising, all that stuff gets factored into the cost of my jewelry. Um, and sometimes, you know, I end up having to raise the price, you know, after a year or two, uh, you know, it's only a dollar or two here or there, and it doesn't really affect my sales too much, but it's just the, the cost of business. But um, I have to look at, at the breakdown of all of that. Um, I need to know, you know, exactly if, I, if I'm using saw blades, like how many pieces can I cut with each saw blade before that blade needs to get replaced and how much is that costing me? And, you know, all these little things start to add up. Um, but it's really good to know, and that helps you understand that it's not just the cost of the material that you're buying. There, there's all mm -hmm. these other little factors that you don't think of that are costing you money. So, I don't know. I, I guess I don't have a real answer for you as far as, like, how do you determine it besides you just have to get really anal with figuring out exactly how much you're spending on that and how much your time is worth as well. So. Well, I feel like, in all honesty, like, so many people who are getting into just the like start of trying to sell what they make, they shortchange themselves so much and they end up getting into this dive where they're like, they finally realize like two years in, oh, I actually need to charge more for this. And then all of a sudden they're charging more and all their customers are going away. And so it's something like, if you don't think about this from the beginning, you're going to end up thinking about it in the end. And it's yep. going to look bad when you immediately mark up all your stuff like 15 to 20% because you finally realize what you're actually worth. And it's a it's a pit that I fall into too. Even as you know, I I went to school to be an industrial engineer, so this is should be how I think. But like when I built the uh, prototype for the i four, I had so much stuff uh, 
like laying around as I built it. I didn't really ever take into account how much stuff I grabbed from my personal stores versus what I bought specifically for the build. So then when I went to put together the actual bomb, I missed so many things because I didn't, I just didn't think about like, oh, I, I needed this piece of wire to run this limit switch. And you know that didn't get included into the bomb. And that was part of the reason why my, my class had trouble. But I think that's part of why um, the guys that do these quick, short run open source projects have trouble initially is they just don't take into account everything. Um, yeah. And yeah, that's, that's, the art, that's what the article goes into. It's like, you know, you got bits of wire for connecting components that usually people have lying around so they don't count it. Let me show you, know, you all the various hot. lengths of wire I used. <laughs> <laughs> Ribbon cables for days. <laughs> and like just hot glue, like how much hot glue are you yeah. using? And, uh, you know, just all these tiny little consumables that doesn't, you don't really count when you're just making one. But when you're making thousands, that's a lot of hot glue. Yeah. Yep. And maybe you should reconsider using hot glue in your production units. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's all right. Yeah, that's that's. It, yeah. It's interesting that that article hit while we, I'm here talking yeah, to you. Well, I will say that's probably an older, like, it's on the well, sixth. New to us? No, it was <laughs> December December sixth today. Today's the eighth. Yeah. So it was this. It was this oh, week. Old, yeah. old news. Old news. <laughs> yeah. We've got the stale maker news. Stale maker <laughs> Two days news. old. I, uh, all right. the, the other thing that um, has been in maker news all over the place and keeps getting brought to us is the whole 3D printing nanoparticle concern again. Yeah, that thing. Yeah. That, that old thing. So UL went back through and did a longer term study apparently and figured out that oh yes there are nanical nanoparticles released during the 3d printer process but i the articles that i have read and the research that i independently did when this initially came out and uh worked with uh, a couple labs at caterpillar on um it all came back down to um if you use subtle common sense with 3d printing it's uh it's just not an issue so you know don't work in a office that's the size of a closet with the door shut next to your 3d printer with no ventilation and you'll probably be fine um well joe we all know common sense isn't that common (laughs) that's that's the saying that's the saying but (laughs) Yeah, you, know, you can be in the same room as a 3D printer and it's not a giant concern. As long as you're turning the air over at a normal rate with a normal household ventilation system, it's it's going to be fine. Um there's a bunch of enclosures coming out right now uh with HEPA filters built into them. Huh. Nanoparticles blow right through them like you know, water through a sieve. The the nanoparticles that they're seeing are 10 microns HEPA filters down to 30 microns. So 10 microns just blows right through. Um, What we were looking at needing to filter them out was a fluidized or a pressure pressurized fluid bed filter. Um, So, you know, an incredible. What is that for those who have no clue what that is? You think about it. It, I completely it, know what that is, but for those who don't know, yeah, yeah, it, it's you know, you're actually evacuating the air, pressurizing it, and then shoving it through a fluidized bed of filtration media uh, that can capture that those ten micron particles, and then you know, release it back through. Um, I've got like three of those sitting around my house right now. I mean, doesn't everybody? Yeah, yeah, it's like twenty thousand oh, yeah. dollars for one of them. Uh, I have so many of those. My hotel room has one sitting right next to me. (laughs) Yes. No, Um, it's it's something that like I I think we see like every it it feels like every six months 
where yeah. a new study comes out that is this is what you should fear about 3D printing. And it, if you really look into it, if you really deep dive the actual data and you actually look at what you're what you're reading, a lot of it comes down to just don't be stupid. Like it, yeah. all of the fire stuff, all of the like oh, yeah. um OG oh, thinks I'm cured. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's it's just like don't just read and like ninety percent of the time you'll be fine. Yeah, with with the nanoparticle thing, if you cook with Teflon pans and sit in a room with new carpet or cook on a grill <laughs> or uh smoke or stand next to somebody who smokes or stand next to a campfire hey. or you know, any of these things, all of those are significantly worse for you than being next hey. to a 3D printer. So, Hey, smoking is great for the environment. Yes. Yes, it, it is. It, it, it kills the cast, environment's greatest threat. We talked about how cast iron pans are just Which superior. is us. Cast I iron. Mean, yes. Cast iron pans are superior in okay. every way. Okay. Yes. They are very yeah. much. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can all agree on that. <laughs> yes. Good talk. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, so I I know which article you're talking about, and we'll link that in the notes too. Yeah, because I think somebody posted it in our Slack channel somewhere multiple mm -hmm. times, and yeah. then you know I've been sent it multiple times lately, and they're like, "Did you know that what you're doing is dangerous?" And did you so know? So it actually got it got uh, published to the the caterpillar like the hob the maker uh, Yammer group. Yeah, and it sounds like oh, I've got a someone's got a printer right next to my desk and. I'm gonna have to talk to HR and all this stuff. Yeah, and we like, already did that. We already did all that. You're fine. <laughs> I Put these VOCs. I personally did that. You're fine. Um. <laughs> oh, great, Joe did it. I, I, I'm so, I feel so protected now. <laughs> Good. Oh man, you should feel yeah. protected. Yeah. Okay, so that was the news. Um. <laughs> Let's see. Um, as far as we have lost our rhythm, we had a great far... rhythm. And then we were like, "Oh, we should do some interviews. Interviews yeah, would be fun." Really, and the interviews were fun, and then well, they screwed up our rhythm. I mean, it, it's <laughs> half we've lost our rhythm, and it's half like there is a little bit of lag, and it's just like a second of waiting. Like, wait, yeah, uh, okay, okay, and it, like, hey, so if this episode comes off a little bit where it's like not our norm. It's because we are truly testing out the actual remote capabilities of what we're doing, and we're just still getting used to it. We're like, please give us patience. We're only eh. what less than twenty episodes in. Uh, yeah. So we're. If you still don't like discovering... it, just go back and listen to one of your other favorite ones. Yeah. Or come back next yeah. week. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Or let us know how to do it better. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So somebody uh, on the internet knows how to do it better than us. Sure. Yeah, cause, yeah, because we're idiots. <laughs> Boy, are we! <laughs> Brian, do you know how to do a podcast better? Obviously. <laughs> so for the, for the next segment in this loosely structured episode, um, I was I was thinking we could have uh, Brian do a quick background on what he who he is and what he does, and because he's our he's our first non non company guest co-host so i just figured it give him a chance to say who he is what he does why does he do what he do i don't know i'm 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 tipsy <laughs> once again so, aaron ruins the episode brian who are you i'm brian um <laughs> uh, i'm brian thomas i have been in the body art industry for about 16 years now um i know right i'm old as so old it's ridiculous um i own a studio in knoxville tennessee called born this way body arts and i have a wholesale jewelry company called jewelry this way as you can see there's a little theme there uh what else do i do um i've been body piercing for 16 years been tattooing for six years um now I am a glorified accountant and manager of a big staff, 
and we're in the process of opening up a second location, which has been just an absolute nightmare of purchasing a building, renovating a building, and all that good stuff. Uh, what else is cool about me, Joe? Uh, you briefly did like glass jewelry and wood turning and like, yeah, I did make stuff. I, I started out making glass jewelry and then I found out that glass gets real hot when you make it on the torch <laughs> and I kept burning myself. Huh. <laughs> Funny how that works. And, um, although I, jo I don't mind the sensation of burning myself that much, which is super weird and we won't get into that. Um, <laughs> I just was really bad at it. So, um, in a fit of rage, I sold all of my glass blowing equipment and I went to Woodcraft and I bought a lathe and I uh, started making wood jewelry. So that, uh, that company was called Good Enough Organics um, <laughs> with the tagline. It you know, doesn't have to be great. It's just good enough. Um, <laughs> I never got super good at it, obviously. Um, but one of the issues that I ran into is you know, making handmade uh, jewelry like that out of wood, which what I was making was like um, was large gauge ear jewelry or gauges as people call them some days or Those plugs, are, yeah, um, whatever. Just so you have a reference for what I'm talking about. But with that, you know, it, I would put in an hour or two making a pair of of earrings, and that's you know from from chucking everything up and carving it out and then the sanding and the polishing process and everything, it was labor intensive and um, I enjoyed doing it. But what I found in the selling of it is that I could buy a finished product from overseas cheaper than I could buy my raw materials in the States. And so having to compete with that market and you know, you're, your customer base that wants to buy artisan jewelry like that is small. And most people that want to buy, you know, at least at this time that wanted to buy wood jewelry, when they can just buy something that looks very similar for $10 online, why would they want to give me 80? So it was nice for my local clientele because they would want to support me. But as far as scaling it, it, it didn't really make sense with the way things had been outsourced at that point. Uh, which led me to, you know, kind of abandon that. And at that point, I just focused more on actual piercing and developing that that trade. Um, and then it took me until up until, I guess, three, maybe four years ago, where I started to see a niche in our market um, with gold jewelry, which become very, very popular. When I started out as a body piercer, you know, it was just about you come in, you get a piercing. Do you want the ring or the barbell? And now it's developed into this very high end um like business, I guess, where we're we're selling very nice jewelry made out of gold with fine gemstones in it. And we have, you know, people leaving Tiffany's to come and make body jewelry now. So we're getting all of these great designs and you know, this whole new market of people want to get piercings. And my my studio is just busy every day and it's it's people you would never think would want to get body piercings, but they're drawn to it because it's just another place for them to wear a cool piece of jewelry. So that's been really neat. And one of the problems we have in our industry right now is that it's, it's grown so quickly and rapidly that these manufacturers that we've trusted for years, they can't keep up with demand anymore. So I'm, you know, instead of waiting a week or two to get a jewelry order made, now I'm waiting 16 plus weeks to get jewelry made and delivered. Uh, and that doesn't really work with how busy we are. So, you know, I'm only one studio. You multiply that across hundreds of studios and now, now you got a problem. Uh, so I felt, I, I felt the only way to really overcome that problem was to start to try to make some of that jewelry in house if possible. Uh, most of what we use is either titanium or gold and titanium is a real pain in the ass to work with according to Joe. So I chose gold. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so what I did is in my learning process, um, I think that, that finding your niche is very important in any, in any resale market. You know, it's one thing to be a jack of all trades and make a, in my line of work, it's one thing to, to make like 10,000 different SKUs and have all these products. I chose to do the opposite in my business model and I make one product and I make it well and I make a bunch of them and I always have them in stock. 
so nobody has to wait you can buy it on demand it's shipped to you the next day like it's just it i i just dumbed it down um and it's grown very nicely over the last couple of years and i'm pretty happy with the success and now at this point now that i have my you know i have my supply caught up to the demand it allows me to branch out now and start experimenting with you know a few other designs and kind of branch out on the creative aspect of making jewelry which has been nice um so yeah that's my journey in making jewelry so as a piercer have you done much uh have you have you gotten any requests for like biohacking stuff like the magnets in the fingers or anything else in that vein i love this topic <laughs> so <laughs> yes i have gotten requests for it um Due to the licensing in the state that I am working in, I cannot perform any of that work. Um, when it comes to anything that's implanted under the skin, my state defines that, that it's not a piercing regardless of the method of how it's put in. Because a piercing needs to have an entrance point and an exit point. And if uh... I'm implanting something into somebody, it has an entrance point only and no exit point. So Interesting. I'm banned from doing it, unfortunately. It hasn't stopped me from getting those things, though, and I have gotten <laughs> many of those things. So, uh, oh, tell me, like tell me, look, tell I me. Like the shock look on your face right there. That was awesome. You're like, oh, this is awesome. So, I'm really into this stuff, and I, I just haven't. I don't know if there's anyone in the area that does that sort of thing. So I'm like, I've been really interested to look into it and yes. maybe do some of it. Um. So I had a magnet in the side of my hand, and it was put in with a standard piercing needle. Um. It hurt like holy hell. I don't <laughs> recommend it whatsoever. And the the magnet was put in. Um, I had it in for probably about two years. I was really excited about this magnet. Like I had wanted one for a long time since like the initial articles came out about them. I was so excited to be able to like feel magnetic fields. And I was like, this is going to be so cool. <laughs> it was the dumbest thing i've ever had uh, the only thing that i was able to tell was if my hand was touching something metal <laughs> so like if i'm sitting at a metal table i'd be like oh my hand is stuck to the table <laughs> or if I'm, I'm pushing a shopping cart i'd be like oh my hand is stuck to the cart <laughs> so uh, so do you feel like that's because uh, is there enough nerve endings in the side of your wrist or side of your hand versus like a fingertip? Uh, it's hard to say, you know, everyone's mileage is going to vary a little bit. The only yeah. time I really felt a magnetic field was using like, um, an electric drill. I could definitely tell when it was running and my hand was on it, but it made the magnet like just vibrate like crazy. But oh. you know, obviously I knew the drill was on and that I was holding no. it because I was holding it and it was on. So I didn't need an extra sense to tell me that, you know. Um, <laughs> now, I've had some friends that have had them in their fingers and they've gotten some more sensation out of them. I personally didn't do my fingertips because you, you run a lot more risk of nerve damage. And if there's a large percentage of people that have these magnets put in and the coatings on them end up breaking down and then right. the body tries to destroy the magnet and then the removal process is just it's you know trying to get somebody to dig little metal fragments out of the inside of your finger just sounds like a really terrible experience to me so i opted out of not destroying my money makers and just putting in the side of my hand ah what kind of coating does your magnet have well i i've had it removed um and it had uh man i'm not as nerdy as y'all it's a it's a big word that starts with an n like neo pro oh is it, is it like the nickel cadmium or Something. It was a rare earth magnet nope. coated in something. So I right. I don't know. There there's some specifics there and I'm not the nerd to tell it. <laughs> <laughs> from, from from the stuff that I've read, you know, it's it's so it's your, it's your neodymium magnet. There you um, go. A neodymium and then they coated it in I think nickel and then they did gold plating for some. But then the gold plating it's really dependent on the quality of the plating. Yeah. This one was like a uh, a thin, like, I think almost like a Teflon style coating. There's other ones that are dipped in silicone, but yeah, they all have a pretty high failure rate at this point. But, yeah. Which, um, is, which is, you know, it makes sense for how new this 
sort of idea is. Yeah, but we've been still figuring it out. Sticking things in well, people's bodies for a while. Yeah, I want to say the magnets have been around for almost 10 years now. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, in all honesty, like, I'm a big proponent of, like, if you want to do something with your body, even if it's a bad idea, yeah. like, try it out. Like, maybe you'll <laughs> like it. You know, I've done a lot of dumb shit to my body, and I don't know. It was a learning process. I had fun with it. Have you done anything else besides the magnet? Uh, yeah, I have a uh, NFC chip in my hand that if I was geekier and knew how to use it better, it would probably be really cool. But right now, you can just scan it with your phone and it'll take you to my Instagram. <laughs> so, Great. So I know there are really cool things you can do with it. Um, yeah. I just can't do it. So. Yeah, we have a guy at the Makerspace that has a, a thing in RFID chip in the in the webbing of his thumb and forefinger yeah that's where mine's at what what does yeah. his do i don't think it does anything now i think he gave up like i don't oh. think yours does anything either maybe your nfc's not on it's on maybe the api changed yeah oh yeah Damn you gotta software source. update your body <laughs> hey man that's the future Jeez. no See, those are really and that's why it's got to be open source. So there's there's a it. there's a girl on Instagram right now that's working on hacking her NFC chip to pair to her Tesla, so she can unlock her car with her hand. I like it. I like it a lot. That's fun and all, except for the 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 Tesla TOS. You risk like losing all warranty service on your car by doing literally anything with it. Well, she's hacking her chip to match her car. Like, so I don't know. Still, still. Whatever, Anyways. it's fun to watch. <laughs> Anyways, if... so the the same so the same guy at the space who has the the RFID tag, he also kickstarted uh, some sort of chip that will act as a private key generator and store for like uh, keys as far as you know cryptocurrencies or SSH keys. That's cool. It can do all kinds of neat stuff. Um, he he didn't. He I asked him for it, but he never linked it to me. So I might ask him again and see if I can link it in the notes in the show yeah. notes. But I mean, it was like an insane little chip that that ha you can store all kinds of like neat technological data in there that's unique to the chip. And then you know, if you ever need like a private key for something or like a unique ID, you just scan it on your on your wrist or palm or whatever, and it'll generate a unique string of, of digits for whatever you need and then really you know awesome. and if it was like like i mean that'd be awesome for like a two-factor thing yeah. where you know it's like boop and you two-factor authenticated yeah because you always got your hand you're yeah. gonna lose that <laughs> until you steal and it gets cut off yeah <laughs> if you live in medieval like, times like i love my rfid chip i think it's really like the coolest thing ever but like any other technology Eventually, it's going to be outdated, and it's not going to be supported, and it's not going to work anymore. And my options are getting somebody to cut it out of my hand, or I just get another new chip and put it somewhere else in my body. And if I keep doing that, like, by the time I'm 60, am I just going to have, like, 10 chips in my body that I, that I put in there? Like, or, yeah, it doesn't scale. I don't know. Yeah? Yeah, exactly. It doesn't scale. <laughs> you can only fit so many chips in the human body before you're <laughs> right? no longer a human. <laughs> before you've gone full cyborg <laughs> transhumanism man you got got a lot of a lot of surface area to fill with NSC chips <laughs> you'll be fine so maybe we need a need to figure out instead of figuring out chips that will that are like biocompatible chips we need biocompatible technology storage I don't so know. it's more of it's more of a storage compartment in your body Oh, and then, and then you can replace the shit inside of it. People have done like weird little, weird little stash pocket things. Yeah. Sort of <laughs> a terrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with all that stuff, you know, I feel like it all needs to be open source because if not, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a shit show. Yeah, if corporations control the stuff that goes in your body. All right. Anyway. That conversation came to a natural close. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. 
Um, so Brian, was there anything else besides the magnet and the chip? I mean, have you gotten any other requests as a, as a, as a tattooist or piercist for any of that stuff? No, I don't really advertise my, I mean, I don't do like anything outside of piercing and tattooing. I don't do heavy modifications or anything like that. And most people that are after that kind of stuff, seek out those types of practitioners. Um, so it's not really in my my list of services that I offer. I guess how much how much does it cost to get licensed for that? Because in your state, you said you need a licensure for it. Well, licensing to do piercing or tattooing is about a hundred and fifty a year. There is no licensing that will allow me to do things like heavy modifications. All that stuff is primarily done underground and under the radar. Ah, okay. There are other states though that have like like my NFC chip came in um a preloaded syringe, so basically it it's exactly the same thing as like what they're doing to microchip cats and dogs and stuff like that. There are other yeah. states that have different wording on their laws to where it's completely legal to do those things. It uh, doesn't mean that every piercer should be out there putting microchips in people, but um it is something that's doable and you know it's going to just going to vary from state to state. My parents would call that the sign of the beast. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, that's the I would agree with them, but that's I a cell my phone. Cord, so. That that's what I tell them whenever they hear the chip thing. I'm like, you're carrying a smartphone, right? Yeah. Everybody is is wanting the smartphone <laughs> that can track you and listen and identify you and <laughs> <laughs> Running down that rabbit hole again. You're all the you're all the you're all the holding that, Pastor. What are you talking about? <laughs> I had a dream the Anyways. other night that I had a flip phone. It was awesome. Ruffled enough feathers. Let's see. Do we have any makerspace news? Besides the fact that Joe and Chris are stepping down soon. Tired. I already have so many ideas on how to be a pain in the butt member. It's going to be great. I'm excited. I'm, ex- I'm excited to be like, Joe, you're just a member. <laughs> no, it's going to be great. You hold no power here. I, I am very, very excited to uh, focus on MakerFest next year without focusing on running the uh, Makerspace. I think that'll be great because I really have no real interest in running MakerFest. Yeah. I just want to see it. I want to see it do better, but I also would rather focus on the Makerspace. Yeah. Personally. So I'm so looking forward to that. be a great synergy. Well, we're, we're headed towards the, our 45 minute mark. And oh, really? Yeah. And I think we well, ju- just lost Chris on the discord call. So yeah, his, his, he was having audio issues. So you want to go ahead and call it? I think we could. All the all the discussion was great. Yeah. Yeah. Anything to add? Um, I'd like to thank you guys for having me on today. It's been a pleasure. I've had a really good time. Uh, the drinks were delicious. The company was even better. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> it's been a good day. We went to Knifeworks and bought a twelve dollar crossbow that fell apart after like ten shots, which was fun. Like it yeah, exploded well, that's why, apart. That's why I don't. That's why I don't spend twelve dollars on a crossbow. But man, it was fun, and it. it the I'm first no crossbow. Shots. I'm not a crossbow expert, but <laughs> we had fun, and we shot a can with a BB gun. Yeah, in the yard, that was pretty great. <laughs> no one shot their eye out, so I call it what, a success. What are you? What are you? Twelve? Yeah. Yeah, kinda. <laughs> when I come here, I'm twelve. <laughs> nope, we got Chris back. Welcome back. You got anything to add? Sorry. To the episode? Yes. No, absolutely. Um, The number 42 is the best above all, and that is the answer to everything. (laughs) There you have it. I don't get it. (laughs) 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 All right, guys. We're done.
Oh, good. <laughs> well, sorry for my brief absence, but uh, it was good to finally be back on another yeah. episode. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't say the Keep making once. stuff. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Keep making stuff. Oh, good. This is the end of the podcast. <laughs>